And so consider that when you're looking at a human being and you think they're just like you, not necessarily, not necessarily. And the difference might have begun already when they're in the womb. Which means when you're looking at a human's behavior and you're judging it, consider what kind of experiences form the brain that drives that behavior. And we think we could deal with this in our own life. We say, well, why couldn't they deal with it? Own life? We're full of judgment. Why couldn't they deal with it? If you've never been profoundly depressed, you don't have an idea what it's like to be depressed. You have no idea what it's like to have life be utterly drab and meaningless and, and, and threatening to the point that you might even want to leave life. Our difficulty or inability to perceive the experiences of others is all the more pronounced, the more distant those experiences are from ours in time, space, or quality. We can be moved by the tragedy of mass starvation on a far continent. After all, we have all known physical hunger, if only temporarily. But it takes a greater effort of emotional imagination to empathize with the addict. Because we think that the experience of the addict is so far removed from ours. Well, let me see if that's really true or not, or whether it's just an actual fact of uh, denial. How many of you would acknowledge that at one time or another in your life you had an addiction to anything? I don't care what. Just raise your hands. Okay, you've got the vast majority here. What did you get from it? What did it do for you temporarily that you wanted or craved? What was the benefit the so-called benefit that you got from it. Pleasure is something we all want. In fact, it's necessary for life. The real question is, given God's green earth and everything in it, why did you lack pleasure in your life? Numbing. When do people have to be numbed? It's when you go to the dentist. It's when you're going to have pain. So it's a response to pain. And comfort. Again, it's something that's a totally normal, normal human aspiration. The problem is that you were in so much discomfort that you didn't know what to do with it. And so that we see that the addiction is not a choice that you made, nor is it a disease that you inherited. It was an attempt to solve a problem. The problem of pain, so you had to be numbed. The problem of lack of pleasure, of, of alienation, of boredom. The problem of discomfort. If we want to understand why you lacked comfort, why you lacked pleasure, why you had pain, we have to look at your life. And these factors always goes back to childhood trauma in every single case. This is what we don't learn. We don't learn that human experience is shaped or human functioning is shaped by human experience in the world. Yet another study talking about pain that shows that people with adverse childhood experiences are much more likely to have chronic pain as adults. Now, I could go into the physiology of that. It's very straightforward, but nobody teaches you that. So all you see is a drug seeker. You don't see a traumatized person whose physiology is responding to painful childhood experiences. The difficulty that we have is that we have trouble understanding people with different formative experiences than ours. And precisely because, if I look at something like addiction, as you could see from the show of hands here, it really is a matter of a spectrum, and we're just about all of us are on the spectrum. But precisely because we're all on the spectrum, and we think we could deal with this in our own life, we say, well, why couldn't they deal with it? And we're full of judgment. Why couldn't they deal with it? If you've never been profoundly depressed, you don't have an idea what it's like to be depressed. You have no idea what it's like to have life be utterly drab and meaningless and, 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 and threatening to the point that you might even want to leave life, to the point of trying to kill yourself. Because it is on a spectrum, and we've all felt down sometimes. We've all felt alienated sometimes, but we snapped out of it. And we have no idea what it's like to be deeply into it, where a choice no longer exists. And so... We have great difficulty understanding people whose brains give them a different experience of life. There's also something else that comes into it. Uh, there's a new word I learned recently uh, called intersectionality. 
here's what it means. We're all human beings. We all share that. We all share our, our species being as, as, you, as homo sapiens. But then we start to have different experiences. Now, most of us in this room, as I look around, most of us, not all of us, but most of us are Caucasians in background. So that intersects. We have that in common. It's difficult for Caucasians living in this society to recognize that not being a Caucasian in this society gives you a completely different life experience. So if you're an Aboriginal native, and the natives, of course, make up a disproportionate section of the care-receiving population, especially when it comes to mental illness and addiction, or when it comes to the criminal justice system. I mean, native Canadians make up, uh, Aboriginal Canadians make up 4 or 5% of the population, but 25% or 30% of the jail population. The same with addiction. We have no idea what their experience is like. We think they're living in the same world. But let me tell you, they don't live in the same world. They do not live in the same world. There's, an, um, there's a black American psychologist called Kenneth Hardy who talks about uh, what he calls sociocultural trauma. And he talks about the black man walking down the street in the States is not the same as that of a white man walking down the street in the States. Now, the white man doesn't see that. He assumes that his experience is the universal experience. So what is that black guy so upset about? But he doesn't have the experience of not knowing when he might be beaten up by the police and what that does to his sense of self. And so we have trouble uh, imagining the experience of others of a different race. We have trouble uh, imagining the experience of somebody with a differently functioning brain. Now let me tell you something about the brain. We think the human brain is the same for everybody. No, it isn't. And what is so frustrating is I travel around North America and the world talking about these matters. This evidence that I'm going to quote you has been published in major medical journals. The average physician never hears it. It's absolutely amazing how there's a screen, an ideological screen that excludes reality from our perceptions. Now, the adverse childhood experience studies, the ACE studies, they looked at 18,000 adults in California. More than half of them had been to university, the majority Caucasians. And adverse childhood experience was physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, a parent dying, a parent being addicted, a parent being mentally ill, violence in the family, uh, <clears throat> a parent being jailed, neglect, or a divorce. And for each of these adverse childhood experiences, the risk of addiction went up exponentially. They multiplied each other. By the time a male child had said six of these, his risk of being addicted as a substance using, injection using adult was 4,600% greater than that of a male child with no such experiences. The risk of addiction goes up, the risk of mental illness goes up, of depression, of ADHD, of anxiety, antisocial behavior, of relationship problems, of sexually transmitted disease, of autoimmune disease, and of cancer. And most of us have never heard of them. And these studies have been repeated in Alberta, in Finland, in other countries, always exactly with the same results. So how's the brain constructed? The architecture of the brain is constructed to an ongoing process that begins before birth, continues into adulthood, and establishes either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all the health, learning, and behavior that follow. What does that mean? That means that the kind of experiences that the pregnant woman has during gestation will already affect the brain of the infant, which means that the infant who is gestated in a womb where the mother is stressed, abused, poor, um, discriminated against, is already going to have a brain disability because of the impact of the stress hormones on the developing brain of the child. And so consider that when you're looking at a human being and you think they're just like you, not necessarily, not necessarily, 
And the difference might have begun already when they're in the womb. Which means, when you're looking at a human's behavior and you're judging it, consider what kind of experiences form the brain that drives that behavior. If you look at addiction, and which circuits are involved in addiction, or depression, or anxiety, or ADHD, or aggression, or anything else, you have certain specific, well-identified brain circuits that stops you from acting out in a certain way. They have to develop. If you look at addicts, the commonest brain scan finding is abnormality in the part of the brain that regulates impulses. So they can't help themselves from acting out their urges. But what shapes those circuits is early experience, which means that the key factor in shaping the proper development of the brain is the quality of the responsiveness of the adult world to the, the needs of the infant. That's what shapes the physiology of the brain. So when you have somebody who's not able to have pleasure, who is in so much discomfort that they don't know what to do with it, who is in so much pain that they have, they have to numb themselves, or they lack impulse control so they act out, you're not looking at a bad person. You're looking at a person whose early experiences shape their brain in certain ways. Or lack of empathy that you have, it comes from, first of all, your lack of awareness of what that person is really experiencing. Because they're experiencing what you haven't. At least you haven't fully looked at it in yourself.